Good evening, everyone. I'm Bob Work. I have the great honor and good fortune to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for New American Security. And we welcome you tonight uh, to discuss a task force that just talked about energy rush. Hopefully you all got a copy of the report about shale production and what it means for the United States and its national security implications over a long period of time. I know you have a lot of different things you could be doing tonight. The fact that you would come out uh, and join us tonight and this many people uh, indicates how many people are really interested in this and how important a subject it is. There will be formal introductions of all of our guests uh, during the program, but it's very, very fortunate for us to have a former National Security Advisor, Tom Donilon, a former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, Ambassador Paula Dobransky, a two-term governor, a 15-year congressman, a Secretary of Energy, and Ambassador to the United Nations, Bill Richardson, and also Senator John Warner, who for 30 years served on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and probably nobody uh, as a wiser, stronger voice in terms of national security implications in all areas, but he has a particular interest in energy. So the fact that we can have that level of interest in this subject just kind of hopefully proves to you just how important a subject it is. And I'd like to thank, I'd like you to all join me. You're all going to be, in, they'll all be introduced formally, but please join me in a round of applause and thanking them for coming here tonight. I'd just like to say a, a little bit about Liz Rosenberg. She is the Program Director for Energy and Environmental Security. Uh, we give our Program Directors great latitude. We used to call this program Natural Security, and Liz came to me after being on the job for a week and said, I have to explain what Natural Security is every time I say it. I'd like to change the title of my program, and I'd really like to focus in on two things. I'd like to focus in on the national security implications of energy and how uh, these things are changing on a global scale, and also the national security implications of climate change, and I like to call my program uh, Energy and Environmental Security. She's hit the ground running. This is her first kind of big event. Liz, we're so happy to have you. Uh, and if this is any indication of how the program is going to uh, proceed under her leadership, I couldn't be more proud and couldn't be more happy. Thank you again for coming. I'm going to turn it over to the President. Richard Fontaine, uh, and he will introduce our first speaker, uh, Tom Donnelly, uh, Donlin, and I would hope that you all have a very, very enjoyable evening. Take care. All right, well, thank you uh, all for being here this evening, and thank you, Tom, for, uh, for joining this, uh, this presentation tonight. Um, as Bob Work said, uh, we are um, releasing this report uh, entitled Energy Rush, which is the product of months of uh, work and, and a task force that the Center for New American Security put together to look at the geopolitical and national security implications of the unconventional energy boom in the United States. And this takes place against this backdrop of some really uh, amazing changes in the energy profile of the United States. And, uh, others will fill in, but I'll just cite uh, just a couple of very uh, quick figures. American natural gas production, uh, for example, has increased by 20% just in the last five years. 2012 saw the largest annual increase in oil production in U.S. history. And estimates for U.S. energy reserves in the ground have grown in the past five years by 41% for oil and 37% for gas. And the U.S. is projected to surpass Saudi Arabia as the world's biggest oil producer in 2015. So these are some of the facts that we have to wrestle with, and uh, we want to dive into what this means for the United States, for our foreign policy, and for our national security. We're going to do this in two segments. Um, we're very uh, um, happy to have uh, former National Security Advisor uh, Tom Donilon with us um, to discuss this uh, for, uh, with me, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. And then for the second segment, we'll have the co-chairs of our task force along with Liz Rosenberg up here for, um, for a separate discussion. Um, 
So I won't uh, go into Tom's extensive background in foreign policy and national security because I know that he's well known to uh, many of you in this room, but um, I will just uh, point out that uh, during his time as national security advisor for President Obama, uh, he delivered an important speech in New York uh, on energy security and climate change, uh, which was really the authoritative statement of the Obama administration on these issues. And he followed this uh, by an article in Foreign Affairs with a title that I, I like a lot, Energy and American Power, Farewell to Declinism. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Tom is very much the right person to talk uh, to about these issues. So uh, let me turn without any further ado, Tom, and, and um, ask you to sort of take a broad view of this. And, and how do you see the top kind of geopolitical implications of this boom uh, that incorporates some of the numbers and figures that I've cited? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard, and it's terrific to be here. The, uh, you know, I gave that speech last year, uh, and in it I said that I thought that we were at the very front end, really, of appreciating the geopolitical uh, aspects and implications of the changes, the dramatic changes in our energy situation. Uh, and I think that was the case. And, uh, uh, this report's a real contribution, and I think Liz and the team have really done a very, very good job on this because we really are at the front end of understanding this. That's the first thing. Um, second is that uh, we need to be careful of predictions here. Uh, when we came into office, the Obama administration came into office in 2008, uh, the current state of, uh, of uh, analysis was that, in fact, that we would need twice as much uh, natural gas imported uh, five years from then than we had at that point. And of course, now we're the largest producer of natural gas in the world. So we need to be aware of predictions here and be a little, and be a, a little humble about our ability to predict with great precision here. But I do think that given the uh, dramatic changes, that there are a few uh, geopolitical points that can be made, I think, with, with some degree of certainty. Um, one is, uh, obviously, there's a direct uh, uh, economic uh, impact. Of the, of, the, of the changes in our energy and our energy future. There really is a direct strengthening of the U.S. economic situation across a number of dimensions. Uh, uh, and there's some disagreement in the literature on this and the analysis among different people on exactly what the scope of the impact is, but everybody agrees it's a positive impact on, on the American uh, uh, economic uh, situation. Uh, greater investment. Uh, uh, lower energy costs for Americans. Today, the, the, the price of natural gas in America today is substantially less than any place else in the world. Uh, it's three times more expensive in Europe and maybe five to seven times more expensive in Asia uh, at this point. Um, we'll see a, a, an increase in GDP, or particularly I think everybody agrees in most of the analysis over the next, over the next decade or so, uh, as directly as a result of our energy, as our energy future. We'll have macroeconomic effects that I mentioned, and as I said, most especially lower energy costs for, for Americans. Second, there really will be, I think we can confidently say, a real strengthening of the American competitive situation, comp uh, competitiveness situation. Uh, uh, gas intensive industries here obviously will benefit directly from lower prices of gas in the United States, and they already are. One of the uh, uh, discussion points that was prominent at Davos last week was the differential at this point between the cost of manufacturing, particularly in these industries, gas intensive industries in Europe and here. Uh, and a real differential, and you see dollars coming towards the United States in terms of investment in these, uh, in these industries. Third, and I think it's very important, this really does send a powerful message, I think, to the world, uh, that the United States has the resources and the uh, resolve to be the preeminent power going forward uh, in the world. Uh, and if you look at it from the different perspectives from around the world, the United States sits here today with the dimensions that you described in terms of about to become the largest producer of oil in the world, already the largest producer of natural gas uh, in the world, uh, seeing imp uh, impacts already on its economy, on its employment, and on its manufacturing future. And if you're in Europe, you see uh, uh, increasing, uh, increasing reliance on imports uh, and higher prices. If you're in Asia and China, you see a, a, a huge demand uh, necessity uh, into the future for energy. And here, of course, uh, really a situation where we're approaching self-reliance uh, with respect to uh, uh, energy, uh, energy uh, supplies. Uh, so it, I think it really does send a very powerful message uh, to the world. Uh, next, I think it allows us to engage uh, the world um, really in a very strong way with respect to our national security uh, priorities. Let me give you a couple of examples on this. Uh, when we were considering putting in place the uh, next level of sanctions, on Iran in the middle of the first term of the Obama administration. Of course, what came into a, 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 our analysis is, okay, we can go ahead and do this. We can dramatically reduce the sale of Iran uh, crude oil into the marketplace. What's the impact gonna be, though, on the global economy? What's the impact gonna be on the United States economy as a result of taking maybe a million barrels a day is what we ultimately did in these sanctions off the market? 
And we had a lot, you can imagine, sitting in this situation from having this debate. You have the security folks saying, we need to put pressure on the Iranians, right? And by the way, we did so successfully. I think there's a direct link between those sanctions and their being at the table right now negotiating the nuclear program. And our economic uh, 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 partners saying, but we need to be very careful about the impact. We were able to do this, right, even at a moment of tight supply um, and not have a material impact on price. And why was that? Because the American production had gone up to such a degree that it actually substituted for the Iranian production that had been taken off the market. That really did, in that case, it's a very good example of giving a strategic maneuver, uh, greater maneuvering ability to pursue our national security, uh, our national security priorities. And it's a very important example. Uh, next is that I think that already is acting to benefit our allies around the world. Uh, the increase in natural gas uh, that the United States has under, under, undertaken here, our uh, reduction in reliance on imports, has allowed what's called displacement, and the report goes into this to some extent, which is in Europe, for example, and around the world. Uh, gas that Gutter and others would have sold to the United States is now being sold to uh, our allies and partners around the world, including Europe, which diversifies the supply, increases the supply, and actually allows for different options in terms of contracts, which can lower uh, costs for our partners around the world. That's already taking place. And as we go through the process of exporting gas uh, to the world, that will provide additional support for our allies and friends and partners around the world for additional di and diverse uh, supplies. Uh, and uh, in a place like Europe, for example, to have a, uh, a diverse supply uh, coming in at the prices that we can provide really does provide an alternative to kind of Russian uh, efforts, for example, to continue to have contracts tied to oil contracts and oil prices. Um, very important, I think, for our, uh, for our allies going, going forward. Um, so I think we can go on, we can talk about this, but those are some of the, I think some of the top, uh, kind of the, the wave top points, I think, in terms of the impact here, which I think are quite positive for the U.S. strategic position going forward. Great. You, uh, I think you used the term self-reliance. You didn't use the term energy independence, which yeah. has become something of a yeah. charged uh, term. Yeah. But uh, there's a, a, a fairly robust debate now about um, what the energy boom means for American engagement in the Middle East in particular. Um, some arguing that with us uh, importing less oil from the Middle East will be less sensitive to geopolitical events yeah. in the Middle East, and therefore we can scale back either our presence or our posture or something. Um, others saying, well, there's a world price of oil and these are integrated markets and we're still acutely sensitive to yeah. geopolitical events there. Where do you come down on that question? Well, with respect to the terminology, I, I, use, I use the phrase advisedly. You know, we, we can become self-reliant uh, in terms of producing all that we need, right, and for our needs, but that does not uh, mean that the United States, particularly in the oil markets, and, there, and we should differentiate between the gas markets and the, and the oil markets, uh, particularly oil markets, it's a, it's a global market. Uh, so that uh, we would, uh, in all circumstances, still be subject uh, to disruptions around the world that could affect prices in the United States going, going forward. But, more, but there's a more important point, I think, uh, and that is that uh, the United States certainly has interest in terms of a, uh, uh, a reliable and affordable supply of energy. Uh, that has been an interest that we pursued in the Middle East. Uh, but we have broader interests in the Middle East as well, and those interests won't go away. So if you combine the fact that it's a global market, that the United States will continue to have to be sensitive to disruptions there, and instability in a place like the Middle East, which still is going to be pr producing a lot of oil, uh, will affect prices and the stability of the market in the United States, we'd have an interest in not seeing instability there. But secondly, we have broader interests in the Middle East. Um, you know, when I would uh, I'd sit down, for example, with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia and others, certainly we would discuss oil and the, and the joint interests we have in a, in, a, in a robust supply of oil into the markets, but we had a long list of other interests that we would discuss as well. Uh, and those interests will be persistent, non-proliferation. This is the reason the United States is leading the effort to uh, prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. We have a deep interest in uh, counterterrorism uh, in the Middle East, and we'll continue to work with our partners uh, uh, and allies in the region. We have an important alliance, obviously, an unshakable alliance with, with, uh, with Israel. Uh, we have a general uh, uh, interest in seeing a, 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 a robust global economy. Uh, we have a broader set of interests, I think, that will, uh, that will mean the following that the United States will continue to have a direct interest in seeing a stable Middle East and in pursuing those uh, particular uh, topics uh, with our partners. So um, uh, energy self-sufficiency, uh, self uh, our energy future, which, it will go, which will give us all the positive things I outlined in terms of our economy and in terms of our competitiveness and in terms of our strategic ability around the world. Uh, that does not lead, however, to a conclusion that you disengage from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's a, it's an important, uh, 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 it's an important um, uh, flawed analysis, frankly. Mm.
And sticking with the Middle East for a minute, um, the Congress now is contemplating additional sanctions on yeah. Iran. Um, some would like to uh, put a mechanism in place where uh, the United States can effectively turn off Iranian oil exports in, in the anticipation that if the negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program fail, then there's something that would compel greater uh, acquiescence on the part of the Iranians. How do you sort of see the, um, the, the wisest course of action in terms of the oil sanctions and, yeah. and, and the course of uh, measures that we would apply to Iran um, given these yeah. negotiations? That's an on. important question, obviously, because as I said, uh, there's a direct line between the U.S.-led sanctions effort to put pressure on Iran to force a choice. That was the purpose of the sanctions, is to force a choice with respect to their nuclear program. Uh, we began to ramp this up uh, intensively in 2009 after, by the way, we gave the Iranians an, a bona fide offer to engage with the United States directly with respect to this nuclear program and they wouldn't take the United States up on it or weren't able to do so. We then uh, went to our allies and partners in the world, including the Chinese and the Russians, and said, we've tried to engage. The Iranians have refused to engage with the United States here. Now the deal has to be that you're going to work with us on the pressure campaign, and they have. The pressure campaign resulted in tremendous pressure on the Iranian economy, as you know, Richard, uh, you know, with uh, got dramatic reductions in their ability to sell oil, uh, the uh, real pressure on their currency, high inflation, high unemployment, the inability to do any real uh, 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 financing in the legitimate marketplace. And that led directly, I think, to the election of Rouhani last spring. And that led directly to the fact that we're at the table uh, now talking about the nuclear program. At least we're in the initial stages of negotiations. Um, I think that, the, uh, the, as I said, the sanctions have been important. I think the proper structure here uh, would be for the Iranians to understand that if, in fact, they don't engage in a bona fide negotiation or we are unable to reach a comprehensive uh, negotiate or settlement with the Iranians with respect to their nuclear program, that, in fact, additional sanctions and substantial additional sanctions will be put in place. And I think that's very important for them to see quite clearly. I don't think it's the right way to go to do it now, which, which would just give the Iranians an excuse to, come, uh, to, to try to grab some high ground, uh, saying that, in fact, that during the pendency of the negotiations, we have uh, changed the game. Uh, that we uh, don't have an intention uh, to try to uh, uh, kind of in a bona fide way reach, an, reach, a, uh, reach a settlement. I think, I think that would give them an advantage. It may undermine the diplomacy. And here's the point, of course, it's not necessary because if in fact the Iranians don't, en if they don't engage in bona fide negotiations or we can't do a, uh, a comprehensive deal with them, it would take about, I don't know, we have uh, uh, Governor Richardson, Senator Warren, it would take about a half hour in Congress, right, to uh, pass additional sets of sanctions uh, on, uh, on Iran. All right. <laughs> and do you? Um, and the Iranians should understand that. Yeah. By the way, it's also important that during the pendency of these negotiations, and while we have this interim deal, uh, the sanctions remain in place. I think it's a very important message for the United States and other countries around the world to send to companies that, in fact, that's what's going to happen, and people should not prematurely engage with the Iranians here. Uh, uh, it's important to understand and, and to very aggressively enforce the current sanctions regime. Do I you, think the United States do is you doing worry that. about other countries? jumping the gun and, and you know, sending trade missions and, and getting on a plane to Tehran, uh, thinking that the end is nigh here. With, I think with a couple of sanctions. things on that. I think, it, I think it's important to understand that the United States intends to enforce these sanctions, uh, the current sanctions, and indeed will enforce additional sanctions if the Iranians don't come to, uh, don't, don't come to uh, uh, an understanding with the, with the international community. But second, another thing's happening. It also puts, this also puts pressure on the Iranian government. Uh, you know, uh, Zarif, the foreign minister, uh, came home after the agreement to the uh, interim deal and was given a very good reception. Uh, that's about the Iranians wanting to see uh, a way forward. Uh, that raises expectations very high, I think, and puts a lot of pressure on the Iranian regime to come to some sort of understanding here. And I th also think the promise of uh, having a more normal interaction with the world economy also puts additional pressure on them. So I think both things. I think one, that uh, governments should be very clear with companies that if you violate the sanctions regimes that are in place, you're going to be penalized and we intend to enforce aggressively. Uh, but it also puts pressure on the Iranians, I think, in terms of expectations. And when it comes, to, you mentioned King Abdullah earlier, and when yeah. it comes to relations with Saudi Arabia, um, you know, the, the, we've been in an an unusual patch over the yeah. past few months. Um, everything from uh, the, the Saudis um, declining the UN Security Council yeah. seat and, and complaints about uh, Iranian policy and, and, and everything else. Uh, how do we uh, maintain ties with Saudi Arabia that will uh, essentially protect our 
uh, our interests in their role as a, as a swing uh, oil producer um, while dealing with all of these other kinds of issues yeah. that they have going Not on. just as a swing oil producer, though, but there's a broader relationship that I mentioned that we have with Saudi Arabia in terms of stability uh, in the Persian Gulf and in the, uh, and in the region. Uh, just that, you know, we share a range of other issues from counterterrorism to proliferation to peace efforts uh, in the region. So it's, it's, it's certainly that we do have a shared interest in energy, but we have broader interests as well. It needs, it needs an intense engagement. The president, as you know, intends to do that uh, directly with, the, uh, with, with, with King Abdullah. Um, the region has seen, Richard, tremendous change, right? You know, if you look at the, 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 the pace, the scale of change since uh, the beginning of 2011, it's been extraordinary. Uh, and I think a number of countries, including Saudi Arabia, are wrestling with that change. Uh, and we have had, obviously, a, a deep engagement with the Saudis on the situation in Egypt. Indeed, I went out to see the king after the fall of Mubarak to talk about that directly uh, uh, with respect to uh, our perspectives on what happened uh, in Egypt. Um, obviously, uh, uh, they are deeply interested in and have a deep security interest in the outcome of the Iranian negotiations. So there's going to be some anxiety over that. Uh, and, and King Abdullah, I think, has a deep personal interest in uh, and real revulsion towards, frankly, the slaughter in Syria. Uh, and uh, this, of course, has caused, uh, uh, have, you know, have, have caused deep concern in Saudi Arabia. So lots of change uh, uh, in the region, and, uh, but still, I think, uh, important shared interest. And what it requires, I think, is really deep engagement between the United States and Saudi Arabia to really look at the fundamentals of the relationship and uh, kind of reinvigorate those. Great. Well, I could continue to ask yeah. questions here, but we want to turn to the audience. Um, so uh, as you're thinking of your question, uh, raise your hand. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, please state your name and affiliation and uh, end your comment with a question mark, uh -huh. which means that it's a question. So, yeah, or not. <laughs> uh, uh, right here in the aisle. Thank you. Uh, Denver Nix, Time Magazine. Um, amid the enthusiasm over the U.S. Uh, natural shale boom um, and uh, boom in oil production and in shale gas, do you think it's possible that we are becoming, in effect, over-reliant on gas, that we are losing sight of the importance of diversity in uh, our energy mix and kind of squeezing out um, nuclear power, uh, coal, yeah. Uh, as as uh, other sources of energy, while we're sort of turning toward natural gas. Yeah. Well, no, I think we need to do. I think we need to. Do, I think we need to do all those things. But but and, but it was just with a specific reference to natural gas. Uh, you know, as the president has said, uh, and I said in the speech that I gave a year ago, it's an, it is an important bridge fuel. And um, the fact is, is that uh, uh, with respect to the production of electricity, for example, natural gas uh, uh, produces half the uh, the uh, uh, emissions, carbon emissions of coal. Uh, so that that uh, 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 transition uh, and displacement of coal-fired electrical generation with natural gas-fired electrical generation uh, has a substantial decrease in carbon emissions, right? And it's been one of the reasons, there's been a lot of other reasons, but it's been one of the reasons that we've seen uh, a reduction in carbon, uh, uh, in carbon emissions um, since, um, you know, over the last few years, although it's leveled off over the last year or so. Um, so it is, I think, an important bridge fuel, uh, but it needs to be done in conjunction with, uh, in conjunction with um, uh, all the other elements of our uh, energy policy, including, by the way, the elements of our climate policy, which include greater efficiency in our transportation system, uh, in our uh, home building and uh, 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 system, uh, and uh, all the rest that, we're, that, we're, that we've been working on. So it, I think it has to be a combination of things, but I think it is. Uh, an, important, an important bridge fuel in those places where you're going to have fossil, uh, fossil fuel as the, uh, as the principal fuel, particularly in electrical generation. All right. Yes, ma'am, right here. Thank you. My name is Jinning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Um, I would like to ask our former national security advisor regarding the rebalance to Asia. Yeah. How would this uh, change in the supply and demand of gas and for fuel of the U.S. Um, give us the leverage regarding the tensions in Asia, especially the Southeast Asia, Southeast China Sea, yeah. and the East China Sea? And given you made it very clear that China and India would be the two significant players 
um, in the future regarding energy. How does that play in to the role of Iran and the Middle East regarding the reverse role of the U.S.? Thank you. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of questions there. <laughs> yeah. you pick, uh, pick your favorite yeah, one. I pick my favorite <laughs> one. Yeah, you know, I do think that uh, that uh, you know, the United States has made a decision to uh, uh, to allow permits for the export of some amount of uh, natural gas. Uh, I think that can be an important source of natural gas for uh, countries in uh, East Asia um, that don't currently have free trade agreements with the United States, most particularly Japan. And it's in the United States' interest, I think, to provide a more d a diverse and a lower price, uh, lower price supply of natural gas to a country like Japan. I mean, a robust Japanese economy is in the U.S. Uh, is in the U.S. interest, uh, and they have gone through a very, Japan's gone through a very difficult time in the post-Fukushima uh, 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 period here. So that's, I think, a piece of it. Um, but you raise another uh, another set of issues with respect to kind of uh, energy-related diplomacy uh, and the role of the United States. Uh, and I think it's, it's, an, it's an important uh, and, profound, and a profound question, and really is at the root of the rebalance. Uh, the roots of our rebalance uh, are a reassertion of the historical role in Asia of the United States as the platform, the security platform for the last 50 or 60 years on which Asia's economic and social development has been built. Uh, and our effort uh, in the last few years to reassert that role and to put the resources behind that, the mind share, the diplomacy, the economic efforts, as well as the security efforts, is really important in terms of uh, reducing rivalries generally uh, and providing, again, a platform on which you can have peaceful rise of China um, and a continued, uh, and continued uh, uh, kind of a peaceful social and economic development uh, in Asia. So that's what the rebalance is at its, at its core. Uh, with respect to disputes in the, South, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, the United States has obviously encouraged and has been directly involved in encouraging peaceful resolution of those disputes, uh, put, trying to put in place multilateral mechanisms in the case of the South China Sea uh, for the resolution of those, uh, of those issues. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a direct interest of the United States and one that we're pretty, uh, pretty, pretty squarely, squarely involved in. Uh, and the President obviously has a very important trip coming up in April. Uh, to Asia, where he'll go uh, uh, to the countries where he wasn't able to go when he canceled the trip as a result of the this, uh, government shutdown in November, which was unnecessary and was costly to the United States, frankly. Uh, but he'll be able, I think, to kind of uh, engage in a number of these issues while he's there in, in April. All right. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Thank you. Francois Béjean, Catalyst Partners. Two, uh, two questions, yeah. kind of the reverse side of the coin, if you will. Okay. One is Nigeria and other countries that produce oil and where the oil is probably their, their primary export. Uh, if we're no longer buying oil from them, they're going to sell it to China or somewhere else, and which will tighten the relationships yeah. with, with, with those countries. That's number one. Number two, uh, as we become potentially self, more self-sufficient, yeah and our dollar becomes stronger, it also, there is another side to this coin which makes it, uh, makes our export more expensive because there's more, you know, more self-sufficiency here and it, hence less, um, hence that the rest of the, the, the some of the other countries, uh, money, uh, 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 currency goes down in comparison to the U.S. dollar. So those, those are my two other yeah. sides of the coin question. Yeah. Well, Thank uh, you. Yeah. There's no doubt, and as it's described, I think, very, very well in the report, uh, that there are going to be uh, adjustments in trading relationships, which you, which you, which you, which you accurately point out, uh, where uh, there is already, uh, because of the huge increase, obviously, in U.S. production of oil uh, and natural gas, particularly oil in this case, uh, there's a reduction in those in the supply from a number of countries around, uh, around the world. Uh, and those supplies will uh, migrate to the uh, areas of greatest demand. And the areas of greatest demand, uh, the demand story going forward is, is Asia and China. And there, by the way, the demand story really is about cars, I think, in, uh, uh, in China. And there will be trading relationships that will be, uh, that will be established there. But again, as I, as I said, I, you know, I, uh, uh, I think that the overall story, uh, though, is, is overwhelmingly positive for the United States. Uh, and we have, a, uh, in addition to uh, to uh, uh, relationships with respect in this one commodities area, we have broader relationships with these countries, including with Nigeria, uh, and will be, which will be important to to be important to pursue. But you're right; there will be the development of uh, new trading relationships around uh, uh, around the world. And indeed, uh, 
you know, uh, perhaps most dramatically will be that, you know, the, the, uh, uh, as the United States reliance on imports is going like this, uh, China reliance on imports uh, and, uh, and their needs, right, are going to be going like this, right? And so it's an interesting set of questions with respect to uh, security around the world, uh, given that China is going to have a, obviously, a, a really increased um, reliance on, uh, uh, on energy from places like the Middle East. Again, as the United States is going down, they have, have a very small reliance on any uh, imports in the Middle East. The Chinese is gonna be, are going to be going like this. So there's a lot of issues here. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, fair to say that the only element of a relationship between the United States and important countries like Nigeria is just solely based on the oil relationship. Uh, and, but there will be trading patterns that'll, that'll, that will change. I think with respect to your second question, I think it's just net-net uh, that the uh, increase in uh, economic activity in the United States, um, um, which could be, you know, again, I don't want to overstate it, uh, but would be substantial, particularly in the next decade, is really net-net just a benefit for the United States and kind of in all its dimensions. Great. Uh, let's see. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, thank you. Jamie Webster with uh, IHS. Uh, uh, Richard pointed out that the U.S. has been growing uh, at, at enormous rates. In fact, the last time that we got even close to this sort of level was in the post-World War II era, where at the time we were also showing strong oil demand within this country. We're now at an oil demand that is flat or even declining yeah. in the last couple of years. And so this has started to bring up the question of, you know, of actually reversing uh, those flows and actually starting to, to export oil. In terms yeah. of a uh, national security framework. Do you see this as, you know, what, what is what is kind of your view on that, and how does that how does that improve or, or uh, or not the uh, kind of U.S. fortunes on a, on a global scale? Yeah, uh, specifically about export of crude oil or natural gas or both. Crude oil. Crude oil. Okay, um, you know that's obviously an issue that's begin that that, is, that has arisen now. It was not that, that issue wasn't on the table really for a lot of years, uh, and I guess that the ban on crude oil. Uh, exports uh, originates in 1975 or so, uh, and uh, would require President's permission to do to, to do so. Um, and we just didn't have a circumstance where U.S. where, where the United States is in a position to to uh, to export. Now we may be in a position uh, to uh, to export, and that's an issue now that's uh, that's arisen. You know, my general bias on this is towards the free flow of uh, energy trade, uh, and I have a I have a bias towards uh, uh, kind of increased U.S. economic activity. Uh, and I think that export of crude oil obviously would result in, by some estimates that I've seen, um, I saw an estimate in uh, Trevor House's new book of $17 billion maybe in the next, uh, by uh, 2017. Uh, you know, that would be a substantial amount of economic activity. Uh, it would allow us to get our, to, to, to dial some bottleneck issues that exist right now uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to crude oil. And the purposes of the ban, as I understand it, and again, I'm not an expert on this, maybe Liz and others can address this. The purpose, is, I, I, as I understand it, was to reduce imports and to protect the United States from price volatility. Uh, those uh, those uh, policy uh, goals haven't been achieved by the ban, on, uh, by the ban on, uh, on crude oil. And I don't know that I see a lot of protection for American consumers in it. Uh, that said, uh, we detect my bias, right, uh, on this. Uh, and I do think it's something that, you know, going forward that we should look very carefully at. And it might be, I think, again, useful in terms of our overall activity and useful as another source of oil in the world for partners and, and allies around the world. But I do think it needs to be studied uh, because issues, you know, there have been questions arise. Senator Wyden at a hearing, I think, uh, just the other day, you know, raised questions about the impact of crude oil exports on the cost of gasoline and other oil products to Americans. It should be studied, like we did in the natural gas context. Before the president made the decision, to uh, agree, whatever the number is, four or five now permits uh, with respect to natural gas. They did, a, he did, he, he had the Energy Department do a very careful study with respect to the impact uh, on domestic prices in the United States. Came to the conclusion that in fact that it was manageable and it wouldn't undercut the competitiveness advantage the United States had and went ahead and approved four or five of these permits. I think that, you know, you detect my national security bias and my economic analysis. But I do think it would have to be something that before you made the decision, you'd have to really go through the questions that have been raised and do a similar kinds of an, kind of analysis. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. We have time for one more question, so it'll have to be a good one. Marie Salino. Okay. Thanks. Marie Salino from Northrop Grumman. You mentioned the important relationship with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. 
And uh, in addition to other travel, the president is going uh, in March to yes. Saudi Arabia. Besides the obvious uh, differences of approach on Iran and Syria, what positive messages would the White House like to see come out of this visit? Yeah, that I think, Marissa, that uh, a couple. Of, well, again, I don't, I don't speak for the White House these days, right? So <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll give you my. Uh, I'm relieved of that burden right now. Uh, but, I, uh, but, but a couple of ideas I think are important. Uh, as I said to Richard, I think it is important uh, to uh, engage on the fundamentals of the relationship, which I think really do, uh, really are rooted in our uh, joint interest in not seeing a single group or country dominate the Persian Gulf, uh, our joint interest in non-proliferation, not seeing Iran acquire a nuclear weapon. I think reinforcing the fact that the United States and Iran share the same goal with respect to Iran and that the United States is committed to achieving that goal through the negotiations and an ultimate settlement if it's achievable uh, with, uh, with Iran. Um, so I think that the kind of getting to the, to the fundamentals of the, of the relationship and really I think talking to uh, the Saudi leadership about the fact that we share a lot of this, we share the same goals with respect to these fundamentals. Uh, and I think reasserting that uh, and engaging at the, at, the, at the president to King Abdullah level I think is important, uh, is important there. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time, as you know, uh, on this relationship and a lot of time in Riyadh uh, uh, engaged with the Saudis on this and really do believe there's a powerful case to be made that the fundamentals of the relationship remain, uh, uh, remain solid uh, and that I think it is important for us to have deep, you know, deeper conversations about uh, the path forward here on a couple of these areas where we've had scratchiness uh, and some disagreement, but really no real disagreement with respect to the, to the, to the, ultimate, to the ultimate outcome. And they include the three areas uh, where, uh, where we've had the most, uh, you know, kind of the most tension, uh, Egypt, Syria, uh, and, uh, uh, and Iran. Uh, I think the trip is a very good idea, uh, and it's well-timed. Thanks for your question. It's good to see you. Well, as you saw, there were many more questions than yeah. we had time to get yeah. to, and we uh, want to uh, have the co-chairs yeah. of the task force come on the stage. But yeah. before uh, they do, can you all please uh, join me in thanking Tom Donnellan for his <laughs> remarks here? Thank you. Thank you.